Hi, thanks for having me. I am super excited to be speaking today. Uh, my name is Ray Baker, Wondersmith underscore Ray on Twitter, and this is my second Layer 8 talk. Um, Layer 8 has a special place in my heart because it is where I started in OSINT. Um, I, I went to a Layer 8 uh, conference about two years ago, and then I spoke at the next year, and now this is the following year. So uh, my talk today is Illuminating Maritime Supply Chain Threats, a Suez Canal Postmortem. So what I plan to do is run through a timeline of events um, surrounding the ever given incident in the Suez Canal, um, various associated threats to the supply chain, and um, how we as OSINT analysts can investigate and potentially predict these sorts of events. Um, I have been in OSINT, like I said, for about two to three years now. Um, I work as a senior cyber recon analyst. I also have the pleasure of being involved in a few uh, OSINT related nonprofits um, that are super important to me and the community. Uh, OSINT Curious and that is uh, a group where we bring OSINT to the community and we present OSINT topics for free and in the form of blogs and videos and uh, used to be in-person events, but hopefully we get back to that. Uh, also, the Innocent Lives Foundation, where I volunteer in the uh, fight against child exploitation. And Operation Safe Escape, where I assist domestic violence victims and help them escape from their abusers. So additionally, and more relevant to this specific talk, is uh, I have a very deep love for maritime-related OSINT. Um, I kind of fell into it. I wrote a blog, and people seem to like it, and it kind of snowballed from there, and now I focus personally on um, mostly OSINT topics uh, relating to maritime. So let's jump right into it. Um, the first thing we need to know when we're talking about the Suez Canal is where is the Suez Canal? <laughs> uh, so the Suez Canal is a, it's a man-made waterway in Egypt and it connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. So the purpose of the Suez Canal is that it reduces the amount of time that it takes a ship to travel from Asia to Europe by about 10 days. So it's a really important route for moving goods because about 12% of the world's trade passes through the canal each year. Um, so if it had to take that extra 10 days and go around um, Asia, or yeah, around um, Africa, it would cost a lot more money. Um, additionally, passing through the canal uh, costs the, the ship owners um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in tolls. So that's really good for the local economy. So the Suez Canal is pretty important um, for both trade and the local economy. Um, so there are some OSINT sources that we are able to use when we're looking into things like ports and waterways and vessels. Um, and this, this talk is kind of a mix of uh, maritime OSINT and uh, a timeline. So I'm going to try and stick in some OSINT things here. Um, so one of the things that you can do uh, to get details about ports like the Suez or the well, waterway like the Suez Canal or ports, we can use things like marine traffic or uh, vessel finder for things like live um, live tracking maps. So in the, the bottom right here, you can see that that's a live map showing uh, ships waiting on each side of the Suez Canal and going through it. And, the, and that's a live map and you can pull it up for free and you can, you can look at that and get the details about the ships that are moving. Um, also on sites like marine traffic, 
um, you can go to, a, you can do a search for like Suez Canal and it will give you details like um, all the vessels that are in there currently, um, you know, companies, if it's, if it's a port versus a waterway, uh, you can get information about the, the companies that are at a port. If you've never been to a port, they're, they're huge. They're like a, a city, basically. It's just a lot of companies. Um, and if you're looking into a vessel, most likely you'll want to know who owns it and who, usually it's several people who own it or do work on it or run it. Um, and you can find some of that information through marine traffic. Um, another good uh, thing that I use often is uh, sh photos taken by ship spotters. Um, so there are people who just really enjoy taking pictures of ships. <laughs> so they will sit at, if they live near a port, they will sit there and they will take pictures of the ships coming and going and they'll post them. I know there are some people on Twitter who do this. Um, they live near a specific port and they just post um, all the warships or whatever that are going through um, that are notable. And that's great from an OSINT perspective because you get a constant feed of things that are going in that port. Um, another thing I use often are port cameras. And these can be found uh, through a simple Google search. You can search for, you know, port camera in LA. Um, these pictures here, I, I, I did exactly that. I did a Google search port camera in LA and port camera in, um, I think that's Miami. So there's tons of port cameras. It's hit or miss whether they actually, like if you're looking for a specific port, whether it has a camera, but definitely Google it. Um, this one down here uh, in the bottom is Rotterdam. And Rotterdam is, they helped us out a little bit because they have a website for the port. And on the website, they show us the locations of all the cameras and you can click on them on the map. And so if you know you're looking for ships that are either at port in a certain place or coming in in a certain direction, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to look at. Um, Another thing that I use often is this um, cruisin.com um, and it, it kind of does the same thing. It has a bunch of port cameras, um, but one of the, the things that I thought was pretty cool is they have a cruise line section so you can go in, you can find the cruise line that you want to look for and then you can select the specific ship and you can see if there's a port camera on the ship, front, back, side, um, whatever they offer. So that could be a way if you know there's a cruise ship near another ship that you wanna see, or there's a cruise ship in a location that you're trying to to see, um, you can maybe use a cruise ship to, to get a better view. Um, like I said, another source, a very large source, um, that I personally use is social media and um, mostly Twitter. There are analysts who, whether they're journalists or just um, maritime analysts, or maybe they um, just want to get information out, like they're in China or you know the Pacific and they feel like the information needs to get out there about what's happening. So they'll post constant updates um, and a lot of them have uh, satellite information so they will you don't necessarily need to have a, a satellite service or subscription because you know if you follow them on here you can use their satellite <laughs> so they'll post different uh, pictures and they'll show you know, an overhead shot of a ship in a port or um, measurements of how, f how big the ship is, where it's located, and then maybe some context about what's going on. Um, definitely don't take it all at face value. Um, some people post things with um, their own personal uh, context added that's not necessarily true. 
So you can use what you see as a guide to kind of dig deeper into what's happening. Um, so here's just a few examples of tracking the Queen Elizabeth, which was a huge, um, you know, convoy of ships um, the in the carrier strike group in the Pacific. Um, and then just some satellite pictures of, you know, Chinese ships and U.S. ships and um, one for illegal fishing. And then tanker trackers is another good one that if you're into like oil tracking, um, they give lots of updates and ship numbers and stuff like that. So why should you care about the Suez Canal? Um, well, you buy things. So <laughs> that is probably the most important reason that you should care is because so much of what you purchase uh, traverses the Suez Canal. So you got to think how much you're buying from China or, you know, other countries that need to go through the Suez Canal to get you your goods. Um, the area or, you know, all these kind of waterways and canals are tend to be highly political uh, because there's lots of money to be made from, you know, the tolls and the money that's saved by going through them. Um, cutting costs. Uh, so it tends to be interesting to follow because there's a high geopolitical interest in these things. So people will fight over them. They'll, you know, argue. They'll, you know, post things. So it's kind of interesting to follow it from that aspect. Um, and another thing, it's just fun. Um, I, I mean, I'm a nerd, I guess. I I think it's fun to watch the position of the ships, what's going on, um, where they're going, who they're talking to, what they say they're doing. Um, I, I just find that really interesting. So now let's get into what happened in the 2021 Suez Canal event. So I'm sure... I'll be surprised if you have not heard of this event because it was everywhere. Um, but we're going to go through the timeline of the event. So first, uh, the ship we're talking about is the Ever Given. It is a container ship uh, chartered and operated by Evergreen Marine in Taiwan. Um, it's one of the largest container ships in the world at uh, 400 meters long and 219 tons. So it's pretty big going through the canal. Um, it's actually uh, roughly the same size as the Empire State Building. Um, and at six feet tall, it's about 218 uh, Nicholas Cages stacked on top of each other. So <laughs> when ships go through the canal, um, they are not piloted by their captains. Um, they're piloted by canal pilots. So when they pull into the canal, canal pilots get on the ship and they pilot it through the canal. So on March 23rd, two canal pilots board the Ever Given and they start traveling through the Suez Canal. And their destination is, well, the ship's destination is Rotterdam. So while they're going through the canal, there's, um, it's not really a storm. I think there was just strong winds, but it pushed the Ever Given a little bit and it started turning sideways and it ran aground. Um, so after trying unsuccessfully to get the ship unstuck, uh, they call seven tugboats in. Um, and I think you can see a few on this, yeah, this screenshot from Marine Traffic. Um, they were unsuccessful. They didn't have any luck pulling it out. Um, I know that this picture is kind of hard to see what the ship looked like. Um, so I have a zoomed in picture for you. So I hope that helps, um, see what the Ever Given looked like. Uh, as the Ever Given continues to clog the canal, uh, you can see the ships backing up on either side. Um, it, we can again follow this on something like uh, Vessel Finder or Marine Traffic to track this. And 
this becomes a problem because all these ships, you know, they're on on a schedule. They have to get through. So they're all backed up on each side and they, they don't know what to do. So March 24th. So now they are getting desperate. They call in a dredger and a larger tug and Smith Salvage comes and they arrive on the scene and they have a plan and they're going to dredge the sand out from underneath the boat and allow it to float free. Sounds great, right? Uh, so this little excavator is, or dredger, whatever they call it, is digging out sand from under <laughs> this giant ship. Um, at this point, this the Suez Canal Authority announces that all movement has been suspended until the ship is refloated. March 26th. Now 237 ships are waiting to go through the canal. <laughs> As you can see them all lined up here in this picture. Uh, the rudder and propellers have been freed. Um, but fleas of ships are starting to make the long journey uh, diverting around Africa through the Cape of Good Hope. Was diverting the best option? Um, going through the Cape of Good Hope adds several travel days and probably millions of dollars. Um, luckily, or interestingly, Diverting was not really the trend among all the ships that were waiting um, because of the financial strain to go or all the way around and add all those days. Um, even though armed guards on these ships um, who normally go through that area uh, have slowed piracy, it's still a less desirable option in a, an emergency situation like, like this. Um, and if they don't normally go around there, they wouldn't have armed guards on the vessel. So it could mean a loss of their cargo or even lives. Um, so going around can be risky. You can track things like piracy. Um, the Commercial Crime Services has this website where you can go on and it shows you these little flags of where piracy events have happened. So you can pick an area on the map and you can see it, they're color coded by like attempted attack, fired upon, hijacked. Um, and if you click on them, it gives you more details about what has happened. So, you know, uh, this one, crew on board a drifting tanker noticed a mother vessel launching a skiff with four persons, which approached at a high speed, uh, raised the alarm, increased speed, took evasive maneuvers, um, skiff managed to come alongside, uh, boarding was avoided. So they give you a fair amount of detail about the event. Um, so that can be interesting. Sometimes they just check it for fun, <laughs> uh, just to see what's kind of going on. Could we have seen this coming? Um, so there are things like choke points um, and the Suez Canal being one of them. Um, choke points around the world where lots of shipping uh, traverses, shipping lanes that might be um, important politically um, that we could use to kind of guess whether uh, something might happen there. We can use past history of issues for a shipping line or a specific area. Um, basically, the past should inform the future uh, about what can happen. Um, and using OSINT, we can kind of uh, estimate things that would happen um, or at least keep... Uh, in the know when we monitor these types of situations. Also, this photo is 
I think hilarious, but it's the, <laughs> the shipping path that the Ever Given took before it went into the Suez Canal. So uh, decipher that as you may. So now we're at March 27th. Um, now 276 ships are waiting to go through the canal. Um, they were hoping for conditions to improve. Um, nothing really changed. Uh, March 28th, 327 ships are now waiting. They call in a specialty tug from the Netherlands and a dredger from Cyprus. Um, they have moved 27,000 cubic meters of sand. So that's a lot of sand, um, not enough to move a giant ship. Uh, meanwhile, while this was all going on, um, Russia took this opportunity to um, talk about the Northern Sea Route. So the Northern Sea Route is not really a new thing. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of new, but it's not new to talk about. It runs from the Barents Sea near the Russia-Norway border to the Bering Strait uh, between Siberia and Alaska. So it's very important to Russia uh, because it could become a route to transport things and extract resources um, from the Arctic. And it's shorter by about 4,000 miles from South Korea to England. It's 4,000 miles shorter than the Suez Canal. So if it's shortening that whole trip, it could be a huge boost to the uh, Russian economy, obviously. And in 2020, uh, Putin released a document on how they plan to develop the Russian Arctic zone, is what they call it, um, including constructing ports and creating nuclear icebreaking ships. Um, there are some heavy environmental concerns with increased shipping in that area like oil spills and pollution um, because of all the ice and the wildlife um, and heavy fuel oil produces uh, black carbon and that accelerates the ice melting rate. So very concerned about this. Um, Russia is currently building things. I know they're working on ports and um, I, I do monitor things that are happening around there. So I know that they are traversing their nuclear icebreaking ships through the area, and they want to promote this as an alternative to the Suez Canal. So now it's March 29th. Um, there are 367 ships currently waiting to go through the Suez Canal. But the ship is now free. The ship is sent to Great Bitter Lake uh, for inspection. So 37 ships go through the canal, but they say it should take about a week to clear uh, all of them. So moving to March 30th, there are now less ships. 352 ships are waiting. So they are going through um, slowly, but it is thinning out. Um, on April 1st, there are 259 ships waiting. Um, again, still going through until the ship owner declares general average. Um, the law of general average is <laughs> it's an old time maritime law that says uh, it's essentially that every company that has cargo on board has money in the invested in the ship uh, cargo. They're legally responsible for the cargo um, and they will split the cost to save the whole. So basically they're all on the hook for some of the money to get the ship unstuck, which is a lot of money. Um, so now the ship is unstuck, so we should be good, right? No. Not at all. Um, according to Lloyd's List estimate, the waiting costs caused by the incident uh, were about $9.6 billion per day. Um, that's a lot. Also, it delayed uh, Maersk 
causing congestion at their terminals. I mean, that that's a huge shipping company. So um, shipyards bottlenecks up through the logistics chain. Um, you know, the one week blockage caused a loss in capacity, uh, forced Maersk to play catch up. Um, U.S. manufacturing that relies on components that produce in other areas um, are also being touched. We know now they they were were still backed up. The uh, port of Los Angeles is very backed up. Um, and then there's something called supply chain contagion, which is when things are manufactured in the U.S., they'll take spare parts from Europe and vice versa. So it's the idea that an effect in one place very quickly impacts another place. Uh, so even though it's unstuck, it the ripple effect is felt um, across the board. On April 13th, Egypt decides to arrest the Ever Given. It holds it hostage, and it asks for $900 million. Um, so that is $900 million that everyone who owns or holds cargo on that ship would have to split. Um, they don't really want to do that. They argue it. Um, on May 9th, Egypt opts to cut it from $900 million to $600 million, which is a good deal. I would probably take that. July 29th, the Ever Given finally pulls into Rotterdam, its final destination. Um, and this T-Rex finally arrives at the golf center that it had been trying to get to for quite a while. Uh, so more bad actors are using cyber threats as a way to attack um, US supply chain interests. Um, using Shodan, you can pick up satellite, like the ship's satellite systems, um, ransomware is being used, hacking. Uh, so it's a pretty important part of our lives because of all the stuff we buy the the supply chain is very important and i think often it's overlooked from a shipping perspective until something bad happens um so as osin analysts we can you know keep an eye on things that we see uh going on uh we talked about choke points before so again those are highly important um as a consideration for supply chain um these are all heavily political and and not only that uh, they could be a potential national security issue um if you think you know over in the pacific if they shut down access to the straits um you know you might not be able to get anything from china and I mean, if we're honest, how much uh, have you bought from Amazon that has come from China? So you, you don't want that shut down. Um, also, the average end-to-end -end container shipment, so from start to finish, involves 30 organizations, uh, over 100 people, and over 200 information exchanges. So. The rough part about that is that all that information is being moved, but with terrible processes generally. Um, this is critical information. So this is bills of lading, packing lists, invoices, um, but it's done in a massive mess of like email and papers and faxes and Excel spreadsheets. So it tends to break processes and sometimes cause more severe issues. Uh, because it is so broken. So how can we as OSINT analysts provide actionable intelligence um, that could prevent a container ship like the Ever Given from being in a similar fate? Uh, so just to recap, we can, you know, we can follow social media, see what's going on, um, see if anybody's talking about anything, uh, look at past experiences, has, you know, use situations like the Ever Given to um, create a plan for the future. Like, don't wait for something to happen to 
to think that it might. <laughs> um, you know, it's just like ransomware. You have to prepare for it um, just in case it happens. Uh, we can track on live maps. Uh, we can look at ship spotting sites. We can um, look for photos, uh, satellite imagery, um, and just generally, I think we can stay aware of, again, the past should inform the future, um, and, and just be aware how important the supply chain is and how important these choke points are um, when a, a ship is going through them or like what is happening politically. So basically that is my presentation. I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope that I have made you like ships. <laughs> um, and if you like ship content, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my name is Wondersmith underscore Ray and I would love to talk ships with you at any time. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, this was very fun.